humans waited with bated breath as their most powerful weapons powered up in Jupiter's shadow, and Dorian warships menacing humanity's last hopes. Earth's fleets emerged from behind the gas giant to right one of two fates, a story of humanity's place among the stars cemented, or a tragedy of desperate dreams snuffed out. Louis Lewis, a 35-year-old engineer, felt his heart pounding in his chest as he frantically calibrated the classified railgun aboard the USS Prometheus. He was one of only a hundred humans entrusted with this secret weapon, capable of hurling one-ton tungsten slugs at a tenth of light speed. As the final adjustments were made, an alarm blared through the ship, signalling the arrival of fifty Andorian warships near Io, intent on seizing humanity's hard-won colonies on Mars and the Jovian moons. Captain Marcus Johnson's grizzled voice crackled over the intercom, his fifty years of experience evident in his stern tone. He ordered the Prometheus and its escort of twenty Vanguard-class destroyers to intercept the Andorian fleet, knowing that the fate of humanity hung in the balance. Louis worked with renewed urgency, understanding that his railgun might be Earth's only hope against the technologically superior Andorians. Light years away, aboard the Andorian flagship Andoria's Wrath, Supreme Commander Orin watched the human fleet approach on his holographic display. The seven-foot-tall, blue-skinned Andorian smiled, his cybernetic enhancements glinting in the dim light. The Galactic Council, dominated by the Andorians and eleven other species, had declared humanity a threat due to their rapid expansion and defiance of Council authority. Orin relished the chance to put the upstart humans in their place and solidify Andorian dominance. As the two fleets closed to weapons range, tensions reached a breaking point. The next few moments would determine not only the fate of humanity, but also the balance of power in the galaxy. Would Earth's secret weapon triumph, or would the Andorians snuff out humanity's ambitions among the stars? The stage was set for a confrontation that would echo through the ages as a young species fought to carve out its place in a hostile universe. As the battle raged between the human and Andorian fleets, space lit up with the deadly glow of particle beams, fusion warheads and plasma torpedoes. Andorian weapons hammered the human ships, their advanced energy shields flaring as they absorbed the brutal impacts. The Prometheus and its Vanguard-class escorts returned fire, X-ray lasers and missiles slamming into the hulls of the alien vessels. Inside the Prometheus, alarms blared and sparks flew as the ship shook under the Andorian assault. Louis struggled to maintain his footing, hands flying over the railgun's control panel. Suddenly, a shockwave rocked the ship, hurling Louis to the deck. He hauled himself up, head ringing, and stared at the damage readout in horror. The graviton cannon's localized space-time distortions had wreaked havoc on the railgun's power systems. Shit, not now, Louis muttered, mind racing. He couldn't let this weapon go offline. Gritting his teeth, he pulled open an access panel and got to work, rerouting power directly from the Prometheus's main reactor. It was risky. The ship would be vulnerable without that extra juice for its shields and engines. But this railgun was humanity's ace in the hole. Sparks singed Louis' skin as he feverishly rewired the power conduits. He was so focused that he almost didn't hear the klaxons announcing borders until the staccato bark of gunfire echoed through the corridors. He whirled, snatching a plasma pistol from the nearby weapons locker, just as the doors to the railgun control room hissed open. Commander Zoltar stormed in, bionic eye glinting, muscles rippling under his combat armor. The burly Andorian aimed his plasma rifle at Lewis, mandibles twitching in a sneer. Step away from the controls, human, Zoltar growled. Louis tightened his grip on his pistol, mind racing. He was no soldier, but he couldn't let the Andorians take the railgun. Zoltar advanced, finger tightening on the trigger, and Louis charged, ducking under the commander's gun arm and slamming into his chest. They grappled furiously. Louis straining against the Andorian's superior strength. Zoltar slammed a knee into his gut, doubling him over, then whipped the plasma rifle towards his head. Louis twisted, barely avoiding the blow, and spotted his chance, an exposed power conduit sparking and sizzling. 
With a desperate heave, Louis shoved Zoltar backward, directly into the crackling wires. The Andorian commander convulsed as electricity surged through his body, cybernetic implants exploding in showers of sparks. After a few seconds, Zoltar crumpled to the deck, twitching weakly. No time to catch his breath. Louis sprinted back to the railgun, fingers flying over the controls. A new problem. The targeting system was still miscalibrated from the Graviton cannon's attack. No way to get a lock on the Andorian ships. Louis would have to aim manually. He swung the railgun around, peering through the targeting scope. The massive bulk of the Andoria's wrath loomed before him, spewing plasma and particle beams as it bore down on the Prometheus. This was it. Humanity's last stand. Lewis drew a deep breath, hands steady on the controls. He exhaled slowly, crosshairs settling on the Andorian dreadnought's central hull, and he fired. The tungsten projectile a one-ton spear of metal, leapt from the railgun at a fraction of light speed. It crossed the void in an instant, slamming into the Andoria's wrath like the fist of an angry god. The dreadnought's shields flared and died, unable to withstand the monstrous kinetic energy. The slug tore through the ship's hull like tissue paper, gutting it from stem to stern. For a moment, the Andoria's wrath hung in space a trillion-ton mass of rent metal, and then its antimatter reactors lost containment with a sun-bright flash. The ship exploded, a new star blossoming in the void. Supreme Commander Orin, standing on his bridge, had a single instant to comprehend the magnitude of his failure before the nuclear fires consumed him. Cheers rang out across the human fleet as the Andoria's wrath died, the remaining Andorian ships faltering in confusion. On the Prometheus's bridge, Captain Johnson saw the opening. All ships press the attack, he barked. Hit them now while they're reeling. The Prometheus surged forward, battered but unbroken. Her weapons spoke once more, missiles and lasers raking the hulls of the disorganized Andorian vessels. Two frigates shattered under the Prometheus's barrage, a cruiser limping away trailing atmosphere from gaping hull breaches. The Andorian fleet was in chaos, their coordination shattered by the loss of their flagship and commander. Lewis's momentary relief was shattered by the sudden appearance of a fresh Andorian fleet, emerging from the shadow of Europa like hungry wolves. At its head was the AAS Indomitable, a behemoth that dwarfed even the late Andoria's wrath. Lewis's blood ran cold as he spied the pulsing maw of a weapon he'd only heard whispers of, a singularity cannon capable of birthing microscopic black holes. He scrambled to check the railgun's status heart sinking as the readouts confirmed his fears. It was in cool-down mode, its barrel still glowing cherry red from the last shot. They needed minutes they didn't have. Captain, Louis yelled into his comms, the railgun's down, we need time to recharge. Johnson's response was immediate and decisive. Ramming speed, we're taking that monster out before it can fire. Louis barely had time to brace himself before the Prometheus lurched forward engines roaring. The indomitable loomed before them, its hull bristling with weapons. Louis could almost feel the malevolent energy gathering in its singularity cannon. The impact was cataclysmic. The Prometheus's reinforced prow crumpled like tinfoil as it ploughed into the indomitable's flank. Louis was hurled across the railgun control room, slamming into a bulkhead with bone-jarring force. Alarms shrieked and sparks cascaded from ruptured conduits as the Prometheus shuddered and groaned. Dazed, Louis hauled himself to his feet, fumbling for an emergency spacesuit. The hull breech klaxons were deafening, the deck buckling beneath his feet. He'd barely sealed his helmet when a concussive blast ripped through the room, tearing a gaping hole in the outer wall. The void reached in with greedy fingers, snatching at Louis's legs. He scrabbled desperately for purchase, gloved hands slipping on torn metal. For a heart-stopping moment, he thought he was lost. Then his fingers found a sturdy pipe, and he clung on with all his strength, the hungry vacuum tugging at his body. Through the jagged tear in the Prometheus's hull, Louis glimpsed the indomitable, and the nightmare unfolding within it. The singularity cannon, damaged by the collision, was collapsing in on itself. 
an uncontrolled black hole blossoming at its heart. The Andorian dreadnought convulsed, its hull plating crumpling and tearing as the ravenous singularity devoured it from the inside out. On the Prometheus's bridge, Captain Johnson slumped in his command chair, crimson staining his uniform. A wicked shard of metal protruded from his chest, his face pale, but his voice was steady as he thumbed the shipwide comms. All hands abandon ship, I repeat, all hands abandon ship. Get to the escape pods now. Pods began to pepper the void, jettisoning away from the crippled Prometheus, but Lewis hesitated, his gaze locked on the railgun. It was their last hope, the only thing that could turn the tide. He couldn't leave it behind. Gritting his teeth, Louis began to haul himself back inside the ship, fighting against the pull of the vacuum. Debris and bodies tumbled past him, sucked out into the pitiless void. Somewhere, an Andorian boarder screamed as it was torn from the ship. Louis crawled into the railgun control room, sealing the emergency bulkhead behind him. The weapon loomed before him, its barrel still steaming. Somewhere deep in the Prometheus's wounded hull, he could hear the hissing of atmosphere bleeding out, the groans of overstressed metal. He didn't have much time, but he'd be damned if he'd let the Andorians win, not after everything they'd sacrificed. Lewis grabbed his tools, popped the access panel, and got to work. As Louis worked feverishly on the railgun, sweat beading on his forehead inside his helmet, a sudden hush fell over the comms. The chatter of battle, the barked orders and cries of pain, all faded away, replaced by a stunned silence. Louis paused, a tangle of wires in his hands, and looked up to see a sight that made his breath catch in his throat. A fleet of ships had appeared seemingly out of nowhere, and hung in the void between the battered human and Andorian forces. At the centre of the formation was a behemoth of a vessel, dwarfing even the mighty Indomitable. It stretched over two kilometres, from stem to stern, its hull a seamless expanse of some unknown iridescent material that seemed to drink in the light of the distant sun. As Louis watched, awestruck, a message crackled across all frequencies, transmitted in every known language. Cease hostilities immediately, or face the consequences. The voice was cold, imperious, brooking no argument. To Louis's amazement, the Andorian ships immediately began to stand down, their weapons powering off, their engines going still. Even the indomitable, still racked by the singularity tearing at its heart, ceased its struggle. The human fleet, confused but unwilling to invite the wrath of this mysterious new player, followed suit. In the railgun's control room, Louis listened with rapt attention as a channel opened between the gargantuan ship and the Prometheus. A face appeared on the viewscreen, unlike any Lewis had ever seen. The being had smooth, grey skin, high cheekbones, and eyes that glowed a piercing gold. When it spoke, its voice was melodious but stern. This is Commander Zale of the Prothean Pax. Your conflict threatens the stability of the galaxy. It ends now. The Prothean fixed his gaze on Lieutenant Commander Sarah Jacobson, who had taken command of the Prometheus upon Captain Johnson's death. Any further aggression will be met with overwhelming force. Louis felt a chill run down his spine. The Protheans, the ancient race that had vanished 50,000 years ago, leaving behind only ruins and legends, they were real. And their technology, if the Pax was any indication, was far beyond anything the humans or Andorians could muster. As Jacobson acknowledged the Protheans' command, her voice steady despite the shock she must be feeling, Louis couldn't help but wonder what this meant for humanity. They had fought so hard to carve out a place among the stars to prove they weren't to be underestimated. But in the face of the Protheans, with their godlike ships and their enigmatic power, what chance did Earth really have? Would they be able to maintain their independence, or would they become just another pawn in the games of older, mightier races? Louis looked down at the railgun, the weapon that had been their ace, their hope. It seemed so small now, so insignificant in the shadow of the Pax. He gripped his tools tighter, a sudden determination flooding through him. No matter what happened, no matter what the Protheans wanted, he would make sure this gun was ready to fire. Humanity wouldn't go down without a fight. 
As the Prothean ship loomed above the battered human and Andorian fleets, a small spacecraft detached from its gleaming hull. It darted towards the crippled Prometheus, docking with the airlock near the railgun control room. The hatch hissed open, revealing a squad of tall, muscular Protheans in sleek combat armor, their golden eyes glinting in the dim emergency lighting. At their head was Krelok, a warrior with a scarred face and an air of quiet authority. He strode into the control room, his gaze falling on Louis, who was still hunched over the railgun's control panel, tools in hand. Human, Krelok said, his voice deep and resonant. I am Krelok of the Prothean Pax. Your weapon has drawn our attention. Louis straightened, meeting the Prothean's eyes. It's called a railgun. It was our last hope against the Andorians. Kralok nodded, stepping closer to examine the massive weapon. Crude but effective, you have shown great resourcefulness in the face of a superior foe. He turned to Lewis, his expression serious. We Protheans have watched your species for some time. Your rapid progress, your tenacity, it reminds us of our own past. Kralok's gaze grew distant, as if seeing into a dark memory. We too faced an existential threat long ago. The Reapers, a race of sentient machines, nearly annihilated us. We prevailed, but at a terrible cost. He focused on Louis again, his voice heavy with purpose. We have worked since then to ensure that no other civilization suffers the same fate, and now we see potential in humanity. Potential to become a stabilizing force in the galaxy. Krelok extended a hand, his armor glinting. Come with us, Louis. Come aboard the Pax. Learn about our technology, our history. Help us guide humanity down a path of wisdom, not destruction. Louis stared at the offered hand, his mind racing. To go with the Protheans to learn from a civilization so ancient and advanced. It was an opportunity beyond imagining. But Earth, the Prometheus, his crewmates. Could he really leave them behind? He thought of the railgun, the countless hours he'd poured into perfecting it. It had been a symbol of human ingenuity, of their refusal to be cowed by the galaxy's dangers. But maybe, with the Prothean's help, they could achieve so much more. Slowly, Lewis reached out and grasped Kralok's hand. I'll come. I'll learn what I can to help protect Earth. He turned to the railgun's control panel, typing out a quick message to his superior's planet side. I have to do this he muttered, as much to himself as to them. I have to see what's out there. With a final glance at the weapon that had consumed so much of his life, Louis followed Kreelok and the other Protheans out of the control room, towards the waiting spacecraft, towards a future he could never have imagined. As the small craft detached from the Prometheus and glided back towards the Pax, news of the battle and the Protheans' sudden appearance was already spreading across Earth. In government buildings and military command centers, a storm of activity erupted. Generals and politicians alike grappled with the implications of this new reality. Some saw the Protheans as a threat, an unknown quantity that could jeopardize humanity's hard-won foothold in the stars. They argued for a swift military build-up, for a Earth ready to stand alone against any foe. Others saw opportunity, a chance for Earth to join a galactic community, to learn and grow under the guidance of an elder race. They pushed for diplomacy, for reaching out to the Protheans in a spirit of cooperation. In conference rooms and situation chambers, the debate grew heated. Voices rose, fingers jabbed at star maps and ship schematics. On secure channels, encrypted messages flew between Earth and her far-flung colonies, between ambassadors and admirals. Change was coming to humanity, that much was certain. But what form would it take? Would Earth chart a course of peaceful exploration, or would old habits of fear and aggression prevail? The questions hung in the air as Louis, aboard the Pax, hurtled towards a destiny he could scarcely imagine. As Louis stepped aboard the Pax, his breath caught in his throat. The sleek corridors of the Prothean ship pulsed with an ethereal blue light, the walls themselves seeming to hum with barely contained energy. Krelok led him through the ship, past towering machines that defied Lewis's understanding, their purpose and function a mystery. What you see here, Krelok said, 
his voice echoing in the vast chamber, is but a fraction of our technology. Over the millennia, we Protheans have unlocked the secrets of the universe itself. He gestured to a pulsing column of light, its surface shimmering with intricate patterns. Zero-point energy, harnessed from the very fabric of space-time. And here, he pointed to a crystalline structure that seemed to twist in on itself, a quantum computer capable of calculations that would take your species a thousand years. Louis could only gape in awe, his mind reeling at the implications. If humanity had access to such technology, Greylock must have read his thoughts, for he placed a hand on Louis's shoulder. In time, perhaps. But first, there is much you must learn. He led Louis to a cavernous room, its walls lined with shimmering data screens. In the center stood a towering holographic display, stars and planets rotating lazily in its azure glow. This is our central database, Craylock explained, the repository of our knowledge. It contains the history and secrets of a million worlds. With a wave of his hand, the display shifted, zooming in on a spiral galaxy. Pinpricks of light flared and died, each one, Louis realized, representing the rise and fall of a civilization. We have watched the younger races for eons, Kralok said softly, guiding where we can, intervening when we must, but always our mission has been to preserve knowledge, to ensure that the lessons of the past are not forgotten. Louis stepped closer to the display, watching as it shifted and changed. He saw sprawling empires reduced to dust, saw species that had once spanned the stars, snuffed out like candles in the wind, and he saw, again and again, the guiding hand of the Protheans, a subtle influence shaping the course of galactic history. Kralok manipulated the controls, and the display zoomed in on a dark corner of the galaxy. A chill ran down Louis's spine as he saw the twisted mechanical forms that hung there, dormant but menacing. The Reapers, Kralok whispered, his voice heavy with dread, the scourge that nearly destroyed us so long ago. We thought them defeated, but we were wrong. Lewis leaned in, studying the monstrous ships. What are they? Where did they come from? A question we have asked ourselves for millennia, Kralok replied. They are an ancient intelligence, perhaps as old as the universe itself. Their purpose, their origins, are a mystery even to us. He turned to Louis, his golden eyes intense. But one thing we do know, they are not gone. They merely slumber, waiting for the right moment to strike. A horrible realization dawned on Louis. The Andorians, their attack on Earth. Kralok nodded grimly. A ploy, a distraction. The Reapers seek to weaken you, to divide you before they begin their true assault. Louis's mind raced, pieces falling into place. The Andorians' sudden aggression, their relentless push into human space, it all made a terrible kind of sense. He looked up at Kralok, determination etched on his face. We have to stop them. Earth, the Protheans, we need to work together. Combine our strengths, our knowledge, if we're to have any chance. Kralok was silent for a long moment, his gaze distant. Then slowly he nodded. You are right. Uh, this threat concerns us all. I will take your proposal to the High Council. An alliance between our peoples. It may be our only hope. Light years away on the scarred surface of Earth, tension simmered. In government chambers and military bases, a fierce debate raged. The Andorians are in league with these Reapers, General Alexei Zhukov growled, his fist slamming against the table. We must strike now, hit them before they hit us. Across from him, Dr. Eliza Nakamura shook her head, her dark eyes weary. Aggression will only play into the Reapers' hands. We need to approach this carefully, diplomatically. Work with the Protheans not rush into another war. As the arguments grew heated, a klaxon began to blare. On screens across the room, images flashed. The Pax, the mighty Prothean ship, wreathed in flames. Smaller craft swarmed around it, weapons blazing, as explosions blossomed across its hull. My God, Nakamura whispered, a terrorist attack, but who would... Her words were drowned out by the roar of a second explosion, the screen flickering with static. On the packs, alarms wailed as the ship shuddered under the assault. In the central database, Lewis and Kralok were thrown to the floor, 
the holographic display shattering into a million glittering shards. Lewis hauled himself to his feet, ears ringing, head spinning. Smoke filled the chamber, acrid and thick. Through the haze he could see Krelok, his face grim as he barked orders into his communicator. We have to get out of here, Louis yelled over the chaos. Find out what's happening, stop this before it's too late. Krelok nodded, drawing a sleek silver weapon from his belt. Stay close, we'll have to fight our way to the command deck. Together they plunged into the smoke-filled corridors of the Pax, the sounds of battle raging around them. The fate of Earth, of the Protheans, of the galaxy itself, hung in the balance, and as Lewis ran, weapon in hand, he knew that failure was not an option. They would stop this attack, forge this alliance, and face the coming darkness, for the alternative was too terrible to contemplate. Flames licked the scorched corridors of the Pax as Louis and Kralok sprinted for the scout ship bay. The deck shuddered under their feet, the once mighty Prothean vessel gutted by the terrorist attack. They burst into the hangar, Kralok's bionic arm slamming the blast door controls. The doors groaned shut, muffling the sounds of destruction. For this one, Kralok barked, pointing to a sleek, angular craft. They leapt aboard, Louis throwing himself into the pilot's seat as Kralok manned the weapons console. The scout ship knifed out of the packs, engines flaring. Asteroids loomed before them, a dense field of tumbling rocks. Louis gripped the controls, jaw tight. He'd flown through debris fields before, in simulations, but never with hostiles on his tail. As if summoned by his thoughts, a squadron of Andorian fighters dropped out of warp, plasma cannons spitting fire. Incoming, Kralok snarled. The scout ship juked and jinked, Lewis threading the needle between whirling asteroids. The fighters pursued doggedly, their shots carving molten scars across the ship's hull. We can't take much more of this, Louis grunted, sweat beading his brow. Greylock's eyes narrowed, his fingers dancing over the weapons console. There, he said, pointing to a narrow gap between two massive asteroids, fly through that. Louis hesitated for a split second, then wrenched the controls. The scout ship dove, metal screaming as it scraped between the asteroids. Behind them, three Andorian fighters, unable to match the maneuver, slammed into the unforgiving rock and burst into flames. Kralok bared his teeth in a predatory grin, his hands a blur. The scout ship's advanced pulse cannon swiveled, locking onto the remaining fighters. Bolts of incandescent energy leapt from the cannons, striking the Andorian ships with unerring precision. One by one they tumbled away, engines disabled, weapons offline. Nicely done, Louis said, relief flooding through him. Now let's get to that outpost. The scout ship streaked away, the battered bulk of the packs receding behind them. They raced towards the secret Prothean base, a hidden sanctuary amid the cold and silent asteroids. As they docked, a trio of armed Protheans met them, escorting them into the heart of the outpost. The facility was a hive of activity, scientists and soldiers hurrying through the corridors. They entered a large circular room, a holographic star map dominating the center. Lewis Krelok, a voice called. A tall Prothean with a web of cybernetic implants across his skull strode forward. I am Jaxa, a chief engineer of this outpost. We've been monitoring the situation on Earth. He manipulated the star map, zooming in on a pulsing red icon. This is our greatest hope against the Reapers, Jaxa said. The Crucible, a weapon capable of unimaginable destruction. But it requires a rare substance called Noxium to function, and our supplies are limited. Louis stepped forward, an idea forming. What about my railgun design? Could it be adapted to fire Noxium projectiles? Jaxor's eyes widened. He stroked his chin, considering. Yes, he said slowly. Yes, I believe it could. With some modifications, your railgun could be a mobile platform for the Crucible's power. He clasped Louis's shoulder. Come, human, we have work to do. As Louis and Jaxor pored over schematics and simulations, Kralok met with the outpost's leadership. Plans were made, messages dispatched. The Protheans reached out across the stars, rallying their remaining enclaves and a select few allied species. The Elenari, fierce warriors with psionic blades, pledged their support. The Vash, master technicians, offered their brightest minds. 
On earth the tide was turning. Dr. Nakamura, armed with proof of the extremists' treachery, stood before the United Nations. Her impassioned plea, broadcast across the planet, stirred hearts and steeled resolve. Humanity, fractured for so long, began to unite in the face of the oncoming storm. And in the cold depths of space, an ancient evil stirred. The Reapers, now aware of the growing resistance, began to move. Their vanguard fleets, long dormant, surged to life. Dark and terrible shapes, they slipped through the void, intent on snuffing out the flickering light of hope. The stage was set for a confrontation that would shake the very foundations of the galaxy. At a hidden Prothean base, a desperate plan took shape. On Earth, a wounded but defiant species prepared for war. And in the vast, empty gulf between stars, the Reapers advanced inexorable as the tide. The battle for the future had begun. The hum of machinery filled the air as Louis and Jaxa strode through the secret manufacturing facility, nestled deep in the Amazon rainforest. Towering trees and thick foliage concealed the sprawling complex from prying eyes, while state-of-the-art security systems ensured that no unauthorized personnel could enter. Inside, teams of human and Prothean engineers worked tirelessly to assemble the Noxium railguns, their faces etched with concentration as they fitted the intricate components together. Louis paused to inspect one of the completed weapons, running his fingers along its sleek black barrel. Impressive work, he muttered, glancing at Jaxa. With these railguns we might stand a chance against the Reapers. Jaxa nodded, his golden eyes gleaming. Indeed, but the weapons are only as effective as those who wield them, that's why we must train our soldiers to use them to their fullest potential. As if on cue, a group of soldiers entered the manufacturing floor. Led by a broad-shouldered man with a grizzled face and a scar above his left eye. Luis recognized him instantly. Sergeant Miguel Rodriguez, a veteran of the Jovian campaign and one of the most skilled soldiers in the Alliance. Sergeant Rodriguez, Luis called out, waving him over. Ready to put these railguns through their paces? Rodriguez grinned, cracking his knuckles. You bet your ass I am. Let's see what these babies can do. Over the next several days, Louis and Jaxa put the soldiers through a grueling training regimen, teaching them how to handle the railguns in various combat situations. Rodriguez quickly proved himself to be a natural, his shots consistently hitting their marks with pinpoint accuracy. But, just as the railgun teams were preparing for deployment, alarms blared throughout the facility. Lewis rushed to the command center, where a holographic display showed a massive Andorian fleet descending upon the rainforest. They found us, Jaxa hissed, his fingers flying over the controls. They must have learned about the Noxium weapons. Lewis gritted his teeth, watching as the Andorian ships began to disgorge thousands of heavily armed soldiers. We have to defend the railguns at all costs. If they destroy them, we'll have no chance against the Reapers. He turned to Rodriguez, who had entered the command center with his team. Sergeant, take your men and set up a defensive perimeter around the facility. We'll buy you as much time as we can. Rodriguez nodded, hefting his railgun. You can count on us, sir. As the Andorian forces closed in, Louis and Jaxo led a team of engineers in a desperate effort to evacuate the completed railguns. Plasma bolts sizzled through the air, exploding against the facility's reinforced walls. Louis dove for cover, his heart pounding in his chest. Suddenly a shimmering portal opened in the midst of the chaos, and a small group of Elenari warriors stepped through, their psionic blades glowing with an eerie blue light. At their head was Commander Talin, a towering figure with piercing violet eyes. And we sensed your distress, Talon said, his voice echoing in Louis's mind. We have come to aid you in your fight. With a wave of his hand, Talon sent a pulse of psionic energy rippling through the Andorian ranks, causing them to stumble and falter. Louis and his team seized the opportunity, pouring fire into the disoriented enemy soldiers. On the other side of the facility, Rodriguez and his railgun unit had managed to flank the Andorian forces, taking up position on a high ridge overlooking the battlefield. With a fierce battle cry, 
Rodriguez opened fire, the Noxium-infused projectiles tearing through the Andorian armor like it was made of paper. The tide of the battle slowly began to turn, the Andorians falling back under the relentless onslaught. Louis felt a surge of hope as he saw the enemy retreating, their ships lifting off and disappearing into the sky. But even as they savoured their victory, a sense of foreboding settled over Louis and his allies. They knew that this was only the beginning, that the Reapers were still coming, and that time was running out. On the Pax, Kralok stared at the holographic display in horror, the blood draining from his face. The deep space probes had detected a massive fleet of Reaper ships entering the galaxy, their numbers far greater than anyone had anticipated. He turned to the Prothean High Council, his voice grave. Even with the Noxium railguns and the combined might of our allies, I fear it may not be enough. The councillors exchanged grim looks, the weight of the situation hanging heavy in the air. Kralok squared his shoulders, his eyes hardening with determination. We must find another way, a weapon that can turn the tide of the war no matter the cost. In the heart of the Prothean archives, Kralok stared at the holographic display in stunned disbelief. The Singularity Engine, a weapon of unimaginable power, glowed before him, its schematics and specifications scrolling across the screen. By the gods, Jaxo whispered, his voice trembling, this could end the war in a single stroke. Kralok nodded grimly, his mind racing with the implications. The engine could generate a black hole vast enough to swallow the entire Reaper fleet, but the cost... It requires the sacrifice of a star, Kralok said, his voice heavy. An entire solar system, billions of lives. Jaxa placed a hand on Kralok's shoulder, his eyes filled with a mix of hope and dread. But it could save trillions more, the galaxy itself. Kralok closed his eyes, the weight of the decision pressing down on him. To use such a weapon to condemn billions to death for the greater good, it went against everything the Protheans stood for. And yet, faced with the annihilation of all life, what choice did they have? John Earth, alarms blared as the Reaper fleet emerged from the depths of space. Lewis ran through the corridors of the command center, his heart pounding in his chest. He burst into the control room, where a holographic display showed a sea of red icons pouring into the solar system. They're here, he said, his voice grim. The railgun units are in position, but... Sergeant Rodriguez, standing at the tactical table, shook his head. There's too many of them. We can't hold them back, not for long. Lewis gritted his teeth, watching as the first wave of Reaper ships engaged the Allied fleet. Explosions bloomed in the void, the defenders fighting with desperate courage. But for every Reaper vessel destroyed, a dozen more took its place. We need a miracle, Lewis muttered. As if in answer... A communication from the Pax flashed on the screen. Lewis opened the channel, Kralok's face appearing before him. Lewis, Kralok said, his voice strained. We found something, a weapon that could end this war, but... As Kralok explained the Singularity Engine and its terrible cost, Louis felt a chill run down his spine. He looked at the display, at the tide of Reaper ships advancing inexorably towards Earth. If we don't use it... Louis said slowly. We'll lose everything, Earth, the Allied races, at the entire galaxy. Kralok nodded, his golden eyes filled with pain. But to sacrifice billions. Louis closed his eyes, the faces of his friends, his family, flashing through his mind. He thought of all they had fought for, all they had lost, and he knew, with a certainty that settled in his bones, what they had to do. We have no choice, he said, his voice barely a whisper. We have to use the Singularity Engine. Kralok was silent for a long moment, the weight of the decision hanging between them. Then slowly he nodded. I will make the preparations, he said, his voice heavy with sorrow. May the gods forgive us for what we must do. As the communication ended, Louis turned to Rodriguez and the others, his heart heavy but his resolve unshakable. Get me a link to all Allied forces he said, his voice ringing with authority. We're going to buy Kralok the time he needs, no matter the cost. Rodriguez nodded, his jaw set. We'll hold the line, sir, to the last man if we have to. 
As the orders went out and the railgun units prepared for their final stand, Lewis looked out at the raging battle, the fate of the galaxy hanging in the balance. They would fight and they would die, but they would not fail. Not now, not with everything they held dear at stake. In the heart of the Pax, Krelok and his team worked feverishly to prepare the Singularity engine. They had chosen a star in a remote system, far from any inhabited worlds, but the knowledge of what they were about to do weighed heavily on their souls. As the engine powered up, its core glowing with an eerie, pulsating light, Krelok stood before the control console, his hand hovering over the activation switch. He closed his eyes, a single tear rolling down his cheek. Forgive me, he whispered and pressed the button. The star imploded, collapsing in on itself with a blinding flash. The singularity engine harnessed the energy of its death, focusing it into a single terrifying point. A black hole blossomed in the heart of the Reaper fleet, a yawning chasm of darkness that swallowed ships and stars alike. Across the battlefield, Reaper vessels vanished, drawn into the inexorable grip of the singularity. The Allies cheered as the enemy fleet disintegrated, the tide of the battle turning in an instant. But even as they celebrated, a sense of profound loss settled over them. Billions had died, an entire solar system erased from existence. The price of victory had been high, perhaps too high. In the command centre, Louis watched as the last of the Reapers winked out of existence. He felt a hand on his shoulder and turned to see Krelok his face lined with grief. It's done, Kralok said, his voice hollow. The Reapers are gone. Louis nodded, unable to speak past the lump in his throat. They had won, but at what cost? As the Allied fleet regrouped and the long process of rebuilding began, Louis and Kralok knew that the scars of this war would linger for generations. The decisions they had made, the sacrifices they had chosen, would haunt them for the rest of their lives but they also knew that they had done what they had to do. They had saved the galaxy, preserved the future for countless trillions, and in the end, that was all that mattered. The war was over, but the memory of what they had lost and what they had been forced to do would endure forever. In the years that followed, the alliance between humanity and the Protheans would grow stronger, the bonds forged in the crucible of war unbreakable. Together they would rebuild, explore and discover, pushing the boundaries of what was possible. But always, in the back of their minds, the spectre of the Singularity Engine loomed. The terrible power they had unleashed, the awful choice they had been forced to make, it was a reminder of the darkness that lurked in the universe, and the lengths they might have to go to preserve the light. Jazz Lewis stood on the bridge of the newly christened Unity, the first joint human Prothean ship, he looked out at the stars, a sense of hope mingled with trepidation in his heart. They had come so far, sacrificed so much, and yet he knew their journey was only beginning. The universe was vast and filled with wonders, but also with dangers. They would face them together, united in their determination to protect and serve. For that was the legacy of the Reaper War, the promise born from the ashes of tragedy, a promise to stand together, to fight for each other, no matter the odds or the cost. A promise to never forget, and to always strive for a better tomorrow. In the heart of the Pax, Louis and Krelok stood before the Singularity Engine, its obsidian surface pulsing with an eerie, otherworldly light. The weight of their decision hung heavy in the air, the fate of the galaxy resting on their shoulders. Louis's hands shook as he input the coordinates for the remote, uninhabited star system they had chosen, the sacrifices they were about to make, the lives they would give to ensure the Reaper's defeat, weighed heavily on his soul. Kralok placed a hand on Lewis's shoulder, his golden eyes filled with a mixture of sorrow and resolve. It's time, my friend. We must do this, for the sake of all life in the galaxy. Louis nodded his throat tight. He turned to face Kralok, clasping the Prothean's forearm in a warrior's grip. It's been an honor fighting alongside you, Kralok. May our sacrifice be remembered. The two men shared a final solemn look before turning back to the engine. Louis's fingers danced across the control panel, initiating the activation sequence. 
the Singularity engine hummed to life, its core glowing brighter with each passing second. As the engine powered up, Sergeant Rodriguez and his team of human, Prothean and Elinari warriors took up defensive positions around the chamber. They knew that the Reapers would stop at nothing to prevent the weapon's activation, and they were prepared to give their lives to buy Louis and Kreelock the time they needed. The first wave of Reaper forces struck like a thunderbolt, their monstrous forms tearing through the outer defences of the packs. Rodriguez and his team met them head-on, Noxium railguns and psionic blades flashing in the dim light of the ship's corridors. The defenders fought with a ferocity born of desperation, each soldier knowing that they were the last line of defence between the Reapers and the Singularity engine. Reaper drones fell by the dozens, their twisted metal forms littering the decks of the packs. But for every drone they destroyed, two more seemed to take its place. The Reapers pressed forward relentlessly, their single-minded determination to destroy the engine driving them onward. In the heart of the packs, Louis and Kralok watched the battle unfold on the viewscreens, their hearts heavy with the knowledge of the sacrifice their comrades were making. The Singularity engine was nearing critical mass, its power output reaching levels that strained the very fabric of space-time. Suddenly a massive explosion rocked the ship, sending Louis and Kreelok stumbling. The Reapers had breached the final defences, their monstrous forms pouring into the engine room like a tide of nightmares. Rodriguez and his remaining warriors formed a last desperate ring around the engine, their weapons blazing as they cut down the advancing horrors. But it was a losing battle, and they knew it. As the last of the defenders fell, their bodies rent and broken by the Reaper's relentless onslaught, the Singularity engine reached its peak. Lewis and Krelok, their eyes locked on the pulsing heart of the weapon, whispered a final prayer to whatever gods might be listening. In a blinding flash of light, the engine activated, a massive black hole blossoming into existence at its core. The Reapers, caught in the inexorable pull of the Singularity, were dragged screaming into the abyss, their ships crushed and shattered like toys in the hands of an angry child. Lewis and Kralok, their bodies racked by the immense gravitational forces, felt their consciousness slipping away. As the darkness claimed them, they knew that their sacrifice had not been in vain. The Reapers were gone, defeated by the courage and determination of those who had given everything to stop them. Across the galaxy, news of the victory spread like wildfire. The Allied races, their spirits buoyed by the knowledge that the Reaper threat had been vanquished, celebrated with a joy tempered by the sombre knowledge of the costs of their triumph. On earth a great memorial was erected, a towering monument of stone and steel that bore the names of Louis, Kralok, Sergeant Rodriguez, and all those who had fallen in the battle against the Reapers. Their sacrifice would never be forgotten, their bravery forever etched in the annals of galactic history. Years passed, and the story of the great battle faded into legend, but for those who had lived through those dark days, the memory of the heroes who had stood against the darkness would never fade. They would be remembered as the saviors of the galaxy, the ones who had given everything to ensure that the light of hope would never be extinguished. And though the scars of the war would linger for generations, the people of Earth and their allies would forever hold in their hearts a profound gratitude for the brave few who had sacrificed so much to secure the future of all life in the universe. Their names would be spoken with reverence and awe, a testament to the unyielding strength of the sentient spirit in the face of even the greatest of horrors. In the shadow of Jupiter, the might of Earth's fleet had been unveiled, and the galaxy had trembled before the resolve of humanity and its allies. And though the cost had been high, the rewards a future free from the spectre of annihilation, a chance for all races to build and grow and thrive in peace, were beyond measure. If you finished this story, please subscribe and like the video, then leave a comment that says, I like the story, and I will heart every single one of them. It really helps me. Thank you for your time.